Bob Herbert's op-ed.tv is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation with the support of Ann Ulnick. Hi, I'm Bob Herbert. Welcome to Op-Ed.TV. My guest is the author of a moving and very funny memoir, Black, Blind, and in Charge, a story of visionary leadership and overcoming adversity. He's the former governor of New York, David Patterson, and boy, is there a lot to talk to him about. So let's get started. Governor, welcome. Thanks so much for doing this. I appreciate it. Thanks, Bob. It's great to be back again. So uh, the last time uh, you were on, we were talking primarily about David Dinkins. Uh, this time, uh, we're going to talk about you, about your life and times. So I guess we might as well just start right at the beginning. Uh, where did you grow up and under what circumstances? Were you, like, were, were you desperately poor? Were you middle class? Were you fabulously, stunningly wealthy? Uh, talk a little bit about the early years. Well, in the early years, I was a child. <laughs> <laughs> Most of the time. <laughs> so, uh, my uh, uh, mother's family lived in a brownstone on Grand Avenue uh, between Gates and Green in Brooklyn, what was at the time considered Bedford Stuyvesant, but you know, in the new age, I think they feel that it's part of Fort Green. So we lived on the top floor of this uh, brownstone and my parents, uh, you know, we're going to move at some point. But what hastened it is that when they tried to register me for school, they were told that they would not have a legally blind child in the classroom with the other students in New York City. This is 1959. Right. So, so my mother, really principally her, she went to Westchester, Connecticut. Uh, she went to parts of Long Island and she found a school district in Hempstead, Long Island, which was one of the top three school districts in the state. And they told her they had done that. They had had a few uh, blind or otherwise disabled students in the classroom with the others. And so to assimilate me with the other students, we moved to Hempstead. Now, my father, who you knew, uh, was right. to start a political career in Harlem. He thought we were going to move back to Harlem and, and <laughs> find a place. And uh, basically, he got moved to Hempstead with the rest of us. <laughs> See who was running the show in that relationship. There you go. And oddly enough, my first day of school, the kindergarten teacher tells my mother, look, do me a favor, take David home, bring him back in a week. I got to get this class settled down. What she didn't know is she was talking to another teacher. My mother said to the kindergarten teacher, I'm a third grade teacher. I will get your class settled down in 20 minutes. And oh. either way, David is going to be in there. So this feud wound up in the principal's office. And I don't have any real memory of it. I just had a memory of the kindergarten teacher not liking me. I had that memory for the whole year. Wow. So, uh, so growing up as this sort of outlier, you know, this different student was positive and negative. It was positive because my mother was right when she said to me, whoever you go to school with is going to be who you socialize with and inevitably who you do business with. And that was right on target. The problem was that not all the teachers were particularly happy about having me in the class. And I think even as a child, it reflected my performance. Uh, I had a sixth grade teacher who really knew how to teach. She's still a friend of mine. And, uh, you know, I aced all the, uh, you know, all the subjects there. But, you know, then I had other teachers that were kind of indifferent. And it really made me understand how important the teacher is to the student. You know, we, we don't pay teachers enough and we don't really uh, think that their jobs are that difficult because they get off at three o'clock, but, but they really are. Right. You know, um, you were talking about some of the difficulties you in, encountered and yet you've had a um, spectacularly successful uh, life. You've, you've overcome uh, all, the, all the challenges. I'm, I'm sure many of them were incredibly difficult 
where do you think you found the resources, especially as, as a youngster, um, to be able to do that? What was it that kept you going? What, what kind of attitude did you have? Did you ever get discouraged? What was that like? You, you know, Bob, uh, having written a book, I would commend to almost everyone to write a book about themselves. Now, they may not want to publish it, but sometimes when you're forced to write about your experiences, you understand things that you really didn't, didn't get before. So right. in a way, I never really resolved a lot of these problems because I never resolved whether I was going to be blind or sighted. And what I mean by that is if I had just acted as a completely blind student, then, ever, then I should have been taught Braille. And, I, and, and it, it was really a, an egregious error that the um, support organizations like the Industrial Home for the Blind and Helen Keller Services and all of them, they were uh, telling the parents in those days, no, 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 we're, they're going to put uh, all the material on records or recorded tape. He doesn't need to learn Braille. And nothing could have been further from the truth. Right Now, trying to act more as a sighted student, my problem was I really couldn't read the books. And when I got to college, the place I hated the most was the library, because now you have to go and find the books before you even can read them. I couldn't right. read them either. So I would just kind of skate by. I mean, I never um, had the uh, grades that were like it was when I was in high school, when I was more closely monitored and that kind of thing. And I kind of skated along all this time. And really, uh, you know, I went to law school. I got through there. It's time to take the bar exam, a place where you really have got to have your act together. And I didn't. And this is the, maybe the critical moment in my life. I was working for David Dinkins. I went and spoke at an event that he didn't want to attend. I got chastised the whole time because he's not there. And at the very end of the event, after I've been insulted about 10 times, um, one, a, a lady said, I'd like to ask one more question. And she said, look, I'm not voting for your candidate because he's not here. She said, but you know, young man, I really admire how you answered our questions, knowing we were insulting you and yet you didn't let it uh, rattle you. And it was the first real encouragement that I had gotten in a long time. And wouldn't you know that three weeks later, our local state Senator passed away and Percy Sutton, the head of inner city broadcasting called me and he says, run for the seat, run for the seat. I said, I, I, listen, I haven't even lived in this area for more than five years. He goes, run for the seat. He said, you won't win, but someone will notice you and this will pay off for you down the road. The only thing that he got wrong was that I did win. <laughs> and, and, and that's the movie that I think I connected with years later was the movie Rocky because Rocky had not handled his life correctly. He kind of just, you know, never tried that hard, never really put that much of an effort in. Now I tried, but it was just that I never got myself organized. But then came this one opportunity and he realized that this was maybe even his last chance. And when I got the chance to run for that office, uh, the discipline, the hard work, the effort I put in was way beyond anything I'd ever waged because I finally realized that if I put that effort in, that I could be uh, perhaps successful. You know, um, you mentioned uh, your dad, Basil Patterson, uh, who was a very prominent uh, public figure in New York for, uh, for many years. He served as uh, Secretary of State in New York. He was a state senator. Um, he was a, um, when I was at the Daily News, I remember him um, being like the major labor mediator um, uh, in, in the city. So he was, uh, he must have been a very powerful force. I mean, so there he is right there at the breakfast table or, or whatever. What was, um, from, from the son's point of view, what was Basil Patterson like and how did he influence your approach to politics? I think that uh, most people assume that when you are connected with a luminary figure like Basil Patterson, that it was, you know, him helping you or him, you know, arranging for meetings so that you could run for things and that kind of thing. 
And I'm not saying that he didn't help, but I think it was exactly what you said, Bob. It was sitting around the breakfast table with him. He was a person who dared to think out of the box. I mean, out of the box doesn't even begin to <laughs> describe his thinking at times. I remember once uh, he was doing an interview. I, he, they interviewed both of us. I think it was the only time we were both interviewed together. Um, and the reporter was talking about the Federal Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act and that kind of thing. And Basil said, I don't think the current House of Representatives and Senate in this country could pass those same bills right now. I don't think they could do it. And then he hearkened back to the fact that the only reason they passed the Civil Rights Act is because they were also passing Medicaid and President Johnson gave the Southern senators 80, 75 to 80 percent of their Medicaid costs would be covered by the government. Well, all the other states got 50 percent and it was a, the proverbial offer they couldn't refuse. Right. Like they thought it was right to pass that legislation. Right. And, and so he would just notice things or, uh, you, you know, think about things that I felt no one else ever even considered. And he knew the value of them. It, it was uh, a, a, an honor almost. I mean, it was great to be somebody's son, but it was an honor to be around somebody who always forced you to rethink your positions, uh, even if, uh, you know, it meant challenging yourself to look at things in a different way. Right. Now, um, for most people, this would be a weird question, but for you, it is absolutely appropriate. And the question is, how did you find out that you were going to be the governor of New York? Yes, March 10th, uh, 2008, and I'm riding up to Albany, as I always did, and the lieutenant governor's office is on the third floor of the Capitol, Bob. The rest of the staff for the lieutenant governor and, of course, the major staff, which is the governor, are on the second floor. So because I'm on the third floor, I don't know that none of the governor's staff came to work that day. <laughs> you would have thought they were on strike, but neither did the governor. He didn't come to work and neither did his chief of staff, his secretary. And so um, finally, they call me around 11 o'clock. They asked me to go do a family planning event. I said, you know, you could have given me more notice. Uh, I'm, I'm a little busy over here. The lieutenant governor is never busy, but we have pride. You know? <laughs> and so uh, finally, I go to that meeting, I come back, and then my chief of staff, who was a priest for 17 years, calls me and says, listen, the cardinal's coming at 1.30 with the bishops. The governor's still not here. You've got to do that meeting. I said, I can't do that meeting. It's inappropriate. And he said, why? I said, it's protocol. It's head of state to head of state. That would be like the Queen of England coming to meet with President Bush, and he's a little uh, busy, so he sends Cheney. You can't do that. <laughs> and, said, and you know that as well as anybody else. Well, he did know that as well as anyone else, but he also knew that the governor was about to announce that he was in a scandal and resign, but they uh, told him not to, to, to tell me. So, so you had no idea. I have no idea. Five minutes after one, the governor's secretary calls me, and he talks about this prostitution scandal. And, and Bob, I'm so shocked. I think what he's saying is that the governor maybe had money in an investment club and the club uh, invested in a prostitution ring. So it's going to be, you know, like a, a real bad look for him and that kind of thing. And so he texts my chief of staff who comes up to my office and I, and I open the door and I'm looking at him and even I can see how red he is. And he says, David, he was with the prostitutes. If there was no wow. organization, he said, do you understand how that works? I'm like, oh my God. So he said, I said, what should I be doing now? He says, why don't you get your pen out and write down some notes, which in an hour we're going to call your inauguration speech. <laughs> so oh that's God. how I found out I'm becoming uh, governor. Oh my goodness. So, you know, for those uh, who may not know, um, uh, especially younger viewers, the governor was uh, Elliot Spitzer uh, at that time. What's your reaction? What is a person's reaction when something like that occurs out of the blue? Well, I was obviously completely shocked. I kneeled down and, and said a prayer. 
uh, for the Spitzer family. I then called my father and he said, you need to say a prayer. I said, yeah, I said a prayer for the Spitzer family. He said, you need to say a prayer for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, he's right on the mark. Yep. And I said to him, uh, what do you think I should be doing? He said, do the other state leaders know about this? I said, no, I think only the governor and his staff know about it. He says, call them, David, because if you're inaugurated in the next hour and they don't know about it, they're all going to say, why didn't you call me? So I right. called uh, Chuck Schumer and Hillary Clinton, the U.S. senators. I called Tom DiNapoli and uh, Andrew Cuomo, the controller and attorney general. And I called the dean of the congressional delegation, Charlie Rangel. Of them all, the first one to call back is Senator Clinton, who is in a big battle with Senator Obama for the Democratic nomination for president. Right. She calls back and she said, David, there was something ominous about your message. I'm calling back, uh, you know, is everything all right? I said, well, yeah, I guess everything's all right, except I'm going to be sworn in as governor in about a half hour. And she <laughs> says to me, oh, my God, what happened? I said, no, the, the governor's all right. It's just that he's going to resign. So now she's getting a little impatient. She says, David, why is he going to resign? And he's sitting there <laughs> staring at the ceiling thinking, how do you explain a sex scandal to Hillary Clinton? <laughs> there you go. Oh my goodness. That would that was some conversation. It so, you know, for anyone, um, being governor is just a tremendous experience or actually probably a sequence of uh, tremendous experiences. Uh, obviously some uh, would be better than others. Um, can you give me a, a couple of examples of, um, the things that you just think were just great, just 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 really great that occurred uh, while you were governor. And then after you do that, I'm going to ask you about a, a, a couple of things that you thought were really tough. So but everyone, first, a couple of great things. So everyone who is governor gets to have their portrait painted. You have to pay for it, but they will hang it. You do? Yes, you have to pay for it, but they will hang your portrait and they'll have a ceremony. <laughs> in the uh, hall of the Capitol. The other day, I had a copy of the portrait. In other words, we took a picture of the portrait was painted and I was bringing it into my apartment and I was showing it to the doorman and he is asking me these questions and I realized, oh my God, like that portrait's gonna hang there as long as that Capitol is there. Like you don't realize that, that having a position like that creates almost like a little immortality Right. And, and it's history. And I love that. I really liked the opportunity sometimes to intervene. There were people who were immigrants who were about to be deported by the government. And um, they shouldn't have been. Uh, one guy was, a, his name was King Wu, he was a Chinese teenager who, um, you know, was in a gang and then he cleans his life up. He gets his, his uh, high school and college degrees. He gets his master's. They want to put him on a uh, the mayor wants to put him on a, uh, you know, an official board for, uh, for the uh, city, and uh, they do the background check, and the federal government sends him to Texas, and they're about to deport him. Well, I pardoned him, and they had to send him home. Wow! And so to be able to intervene in those situations was great. And I'd say the the other thing is, you meet these people. I mean, I met the Queen of England, I met the Pope. Uh, <laughs> I went tie shopping one day with the Terminator. That was interesting. <laughs> so, so in many respects, as much as I was part of it, sometimes I still felt like I was watching it like a little kid. I was walking down the street a few years ago and somebody stopped me and he said, Governor, I, I remember the anti-drug event we did together and uh, I really loved doing it. And I said, well, thank you so much. I, I kind of remember too, um, what's your name? He said, Try Smokey Robinson. I'm like, well. <laughs> See, I want to meet Smokey. Come on. Oh, you should. He's a he is a real gentleman. A, a, oh, and his goodness. wife. But they're terrific. I actually had met them a couple of times, but this was the first time I saw him, you know, just walking down the street. <laughs> right. What's a um, uh, so what are the uh, what are um, one or two of the really tough moments that you encountered when you were governor? I think the toughest moment was when I realized that the budget deficit was going to quadruple in one year, a problem that the governor of New York, Andrew Cuomo, was having right now. And because we just weren't taking in any revenues and it, it hurts the banks, it hurts real estate, it hurts everyone. 
And I sat down with my Democratic colleagues and said, listen, we are mandated by the Constitution to balance this budget. You cannot balance a budget just by taxing the rich. It's $21.3 billion. The only budget that ever came close to it was $10.2 billion when we had an economic uh, collapse after <clears throat> September 11th. And they absolutely didn't want to hear it. And rather than, you know, being honest about it, they just tried to blame it all on me, which I thought was outrageous. And they had TV ads and they went as far as having a blind person. When's the last blind person you saw do a TV ad, Bob? Sit there and say, Governor, you let all of us blind people down. I thought it was a real shot below the belt. And right. I, one of the reasons I waited a long time to write the book is I did not want to write the book when I was still feeling uh, a sense of frustration over those situations. The other thing that I think was, you know, pretty unfortunate was the economic collapse itself. It, it, it prevented me from doing a lot of things that I would have done had we had resources to spend on them. The, um, we've only got a few minutes left, um, uh, but I, I think we have to talk about our current situation in the, in the United States in these last few minutes. We're taping this just about 24 hours before Joe Biden is scheduled to be sworn in as president and, and, and Kamala Harris as vice president. But in the last few minutes that we have, can you give us a little bit of your take on what the country's gone through in the last four years and also the madness that we've had to put up with since the president, since the last presidential election? I think that historically, uh, people who were white in this country and weren't doing well, uh, you know, were struggling for survival, as many are now, were always invited to take out their frustrations or to feel a sense of achievement because they were in a higher class than African Americans who had to give their seats to them on the bus who had right. to sit by themselves in, in restaurants and had to go to separate schools. While we don't have that, we have a notion of it because many of those people who are so angry and they're walking around with military gear on and they're threatening and they're saying they're gonna take back, as they put it, their country. Their country. What's really happening is that they're suffering from the same economic perils that everybody else is, but they don't think that they should be. And, um, and so they find a person like Donald Trump who used, uses the code words in his first speech when he's riding down the L escalator, he starts talking about rapists coming into the country. That was the classic anti-black uh, Absolutely. In all newspaper articles, and I know as a journalist, you've read them all, that uh, they're rapists, they'll rape our women, they'll do this and they'll do that. And when people are angry and they're frustrated, and it does happen on both sides, they will hear that and they will manufacture it into following a leader who can tell them anything and they'll believe it. This election was not contested. The president lost by 74 electoral votes, by 4.2 percentage votes, by 7.2 million votes themselves. He lost every way you could lose. And he's he and a couple of his acolytes walk around talking about they have bags of votes and they dump votes and that kind of thing. Right. Absolute lie. And unfortunately, it angered a mob. And whenever you have a lot of people together, that can happen. And they unleash that terror on the Capitol. And many people are shocked. And I was shocked when I saw it. But right. we've seen it before. And if we don't do what Dr. King said, go back before you go forward, we're not going to resolve those problems. Well, we're going to have to end it there. It's always a pleasure to talk to you, Governor. Thank you so much uh, for doing this. I appreciate it. Bob, it's great. It's always great to talk to you. And uh, to our viewers, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.